Hi there, welcome to Bio24's lecture on antibiotic resistance. Antibiotic resistance is the ability of a bacterium to survive antibiotics. This is what you can see here where there are some antibiotics that successfully kill the microbes on this plate and other antibiotics where the microbes can grow right up next to the antibiotic disc. That indicates that those microbes can resist that particular antibiotic and survive, even in its presence. We've known about antibiotic resistance for about 50 years. The first antibiotic resistance strain was seen in the 1960s with Neisseria gonorrhoeae, which is the causal agent of gonorrhea, the sexually transmitted infection. Neisseria gonorrhoeae also, when ingested, can cause bloody diarrhea and lead to dehydration and death. Now, while antibiotic resistance has been around for a little over 50 years, all of this arose as a result of doctors using antibiotics in hospitals. This has only happened for a little over 75 years. The first antibiotic used in hospitals was penicillin. This was also the first naturally occurring antibiotic to be discovered. Antibiotics, it turns out, are naturally produced by bacteria and fungi in the soil to kill off other bacteria in the soil. In fact, antibiotics were discovered, not created or invented. They were discovered by Alexander Fleming in the 1920s when he accidentally got a contamination on one of his bacterial petri plates. It would have looked something like this. He was trying to grow Streptococcus pneumoniae because he was trying to figure out a way to treat pneumonia. And he accidentally got some fungi on his plate. This likely just came from the air naturally. When that fungal spore landed on his plate and grew into a fungal colony, he noticed that the area around that fungal colony did not have any bacterial growth. Now he could have chalked this up to just contamination in the food or space between the two, but instead he decided to investigate the, the reason why these two growths did not overlap. Subsequent discoveries by other individuals later realized that the reason why these two colonies did not overlap and grow right up next to each other was because that penicillium colony was releasing a molecule that inhibited and even killed the bacteria on the petri plate. That, my, that molecule was then named penicillin. Other research scientists took that penicillin molecule and used it to treat an individual with the very first case of antibiotic-treated infection. In the 1930s, penicillin was used to treat infants that had Neisseria gonorrhoeae infections that could have led to blindness and other ailments, but those infections were successfully treated with penicillin. Penicillin was then used on an adult in the 1940s. That person had pricked himself on thorns in his garden as he was gardening and ended up getting an infection in his body. Penicillin was used to treat him and it seemed to help, but the supplies of penicillin were not enough at the time to save his life. And I just wanna pause here and emphasize that this is what people used to die from before antibiotic resistance evolved. People used to die from just minor cuts and scrapes in their lifetime because antibiotics didn't exist and bacteria were able to kill many, many millions of people every year. Nowadays, because of antibiotics, we're able to save many lives. But with the development of antibiotic resistance that this lecture is about, we may start seeing those life-saving measures diminish. So how did these microbes that infect the human body 
acquire drug resistance. Well, antibiotics, as was discovered by Alexander Fleming in the 1920s, already naturally existed in the natural world. The reason for that is because penicillium, that fungus, has to compete with bacteria in the soil all the time. So antibiotics have been used by microbes to kill other microbes in the soil for likely billions of years. That means that antibiotics and antibiotic resistance have been around for billions of years as part of the weapons microbes use to attack competitors. Now, we didn't see antibiotic resistance in human pathogens because human pathogens don't have to compete against other microbes generally in the body. Instead, what human pathogens have to do is survive the human immune system. So when doctors started using antibiotics to treat bacteria in the body, those antibiotics were new to the human pathogens but they have been known to soil inhabiting microbes for a very long time. Those soil dwelling microbes evolved resistance to the antibiotics by small mutation after small mutation after small mutation over billions of years. So that's how antibiotic resistance first evolved on earth. But then how did they get into human pathogens? Human pathogens are not subject to antibiotics regularly, and so they wouldn't have the genes for antibiotic resistance. The, those bacteria would end up acquiring antibiotic resistance genes from the soil pathogens by what's referred to as horizontal gene transfer where one microbe donates genes to other microbes by various mechanisms. Microbes do this all the time in the soil and elsewhere, and this is how human pathogens acquired antibiotic resistance genes from the soil bacteria that had been evolving it for billions of years. So how does antibiotic resistance work? How do these bacteria resist antibiotics? Now, as we're going into this topic, I want to emphasize, we are talking about how the bacteria resist antibiotics, not how you resist antibiotics. So the bacteria resist antibiotics in one of five ways pictured here. The first way is drug inactivation. So the antibiotic resistance gene that the bacteria can acquire from those soil microbes could be a gene to make a protein that's an enzyme, like penicillinase here, that would just outright destroy the molecule penicillin. It doesn't kill penicillin because penicillin's a molecule, it just destroys that molecule. So we have an enzyme that's destroying a molecule. That inactivates penicillin, keeping the penicillin from killing that microbe. A second way that microbes can resist antibiotics is what's referred to as decreased cell permeability. Decreased cell permeability is going to work fairly well because in order for the antibiotic to function and kill the human pathogen, it needs to get into that cell. So the drug needs to enter the cell in order to kill the cell. The way that these drugs enter cells is through protein transporters. They can't just pass through the membrane, they have to go through channels or holes in the membrane. These protein transporters are used to transport food or other signaling molecules, and the antibiotic sort of hijacks the system and gets into the cell that way. 
what the cell can do is change those protein transporters. So they cannot enter, the antibiotics cannot enter the cell anymore. They are blocked from entering the cell. So that's decreased cell permeability, changing the entry points for antibiotics entering the cell. A third way bacteria can resist antibiotics is activating drug pumps. Now what this does is it can't prevent the antibiotic from entering the cell. So the antibiotic is always going to enter the cell. But in, in this case, the cell is able to acquire a gene that allows it to make a protein that actually pumps the drug out of the cell. I like to think of this as if you're in a boat with a hole and it's taking on water and that water, as long as you're able to constantly bail the water out of the boat, then you can stay afloat. The fourth way antibiotics affect cells, or antibiotic resistance, excuse me, can keep the cell alive, is by changing the binding site of the antibiotic. So here we have the antibiotic in like green triangles. And if the antibiotic can target a certain molecule inside the cell and bind to it, then it can keep that molecule from functioning and kill the cell. But what the cell can do is change the structure so the antibiotic can no longer bind to its target. And the target then is able to continue to function normally. The last method of antibiotic resistance is using an alternative metabolic pathway. So let's say a drug acts on a certain enzyme in this metabolic pathway to create a, broad, a product like DNA or something. What, you can, what the cell can do is the cell can acquire genes that allow it to make the same product but in a different way using different enzymes. So even if the drug is inside the cell and still acting on that enzyme, the cell can continue to make the important product and survive even with the antibiotic present in the cell. Now what we've seen over the last many years is antibiotic resistance on the rise in human pathogens. We didn't really see it in human pathogens before, but now we're starting to see it a lot more. So what has caused that to happen? Well, human pathogens, remember, don't normally have to compete with other microbes inside the human body. They're more worried about the human immune system. And so this is what the human bacteria would normally be like inside your body. This could be like a salmonella infection. In that collection of salmonella bacteria, you might have a couple that are drug resistant, but that doesn't provide any advantage typically to human pathogens. So they're small in number. If you were to take an antibiotic, however, that would kill all the susceptible bacteria keeping only the antibiotic resistant bacteria alive. Then a week or a couple weeks later, it's just those antibiotic resistant bacteria that remain alive and they're able to take all the food and the space that used to be occupied by the general population. The remaining population grows over time and now all the cells are resistant. This is essentially natural selection. Now we've seen how quickly this can happen. And here's some statistics from the turn of the millennia, where we have incidence and prevalence of different antibiotic resistant bacteria. So here with pneumococci, um, it was very rare to have them be penicillin resistant in 1989 and 0% of them were erythromycin and cephalosporin resistant. Whereas just 13 years later, almost half of them were erythromycin resistant and penicillin resistant and roughly one fourth of them were cephalosporin resistant. You can see how these changes occur quite abruptly in just a little over a decade. So this is very, very quick individuals working at hospitals would see this within their lifetimes. In the next section, we're gonna talk about what contributes to this dramatic rise that we've seen.